Today on the bench, we have a Browning Saber. Uh, this radio is in all but mint brand new condition. I uh, don't think I've ever done a video on one of these, so just thought I'd do a quick one to show what they look like on the inside. Um, this was what I would call, I guess, one of Browning's last big hurrahs. <laughs> uh, this getting closer towards the end of the CB boom days. Um, Companies, you know, premium companies like Browning, like this radio, Tram, and a few of the others, they were the ultra-premium radios. Um, their market was starting to suffer some, and unfortunately, they, they did start to cut corners. <laughs> you know, radios that were at one point in time made in the USA started being shipped overseas. Um, so, you know, this radio is made in Japan. Don't get me wrong, it's not a piece of junk. But it's not an early tube rig by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but like I said, it is still a Browning, so it did, did still meet their specifications. But this is a this is a nice radio. You know, a few of the things you'll notice when I you know I talk about the quality, you know, build quality is um, like the chassis. It's you can see that kind of mottled finish. That's not oxidation. It's actually just galvanized steel, and you can see it's kind of. Flexi. I'd almost say that's actually thinner than some of the modern radio chassis. But the, and the board, this was that, and that's pretty much anything that was made in Japan in this era when it comes to CB radios. Um, the, the boards, they're very flexible. They're they're not really rigid boards. So uh, you know they're not ultra uber high quality circuit boards. Um, design wise. You know, Thumbs up. I mean, they they, they did a, did a good job. Now, this remember this is only an AM radio. It is 40 channel. Um, this one was sent in basically just to have uh, get recapped and uh, an alignment done. The customer complained about uh, it wasn't very loud. Now, I actually need to contact him again just to verify. Um, their sensitivity was down a little bit, but actually it seemed fine to me. You know, I turned it on. Now, the first thing I do before I ever turn on the radio is I take the covers off. So, you know, I took the covers off, pulled the speaker wires off, hooked it up to test equipment and tested it. The sensitivity, you know, was actually pretty good. It did did improve some with an alignment. But uh, I'm almost wondering if his loudness, you know, put that in quotation marks, problem was the speaker connections. Um, because when I went to reinstall, after doing the radio, doing the alignment, I was like, man, I still, the you know, the output audio wattage is still it's fine that didn't improve any i mean the wattage you know, output power from the audio amp um sensitivity did increase but i got to thinking about it when i put when i put these speaker wires back on i pushed them on a terminal i was like man those things are really really loose it's kind of a crappy terminal that they use it's a really heavy pin that sticks straight up but the terminal that goes on to it is just a folded around you know kind of like a pyramid that's notched out in the middle and you know, I try pinching it together a little bit. You push it on, yeah, it still wobbles. So I'm wondering if it was just a little bit of oxidation there, and the terminal was loose on top of that. It was what was causing the problem. So never going to have that problem again. It's they're soldered on now. I cleaned the terminals off with a you know fiberglass brush, applied a little bit of liquid flux, and they're soldered fast. Now they can still be removed very easily. Just touch it with a soldering iron, just pull the terminal right off. But it's permanently mounted now. So you won't ever have to worry about, you know, bad connections right there. Uh, like I say, it's a good radio. It's a little unique in design. Um, for starters, this doesn't really use a, I don't even know how this should put this, a PLL, to, so to say, as you're probably most people are familiar with. It's not a TTL CMOS based PLL circuit um, where there's a bunch of ICs in here. It does have an IC, but that's not really a PLL in you know the sense of what you'd think of as one today. Um, and I can actually show that on the schematic. Probably be the easiest way. <laughs> Grab the Sam's manual here. Um, and this radio is 100% unmodified. Nothing done to it. The only thing that has been done to it is the caps changed, alignment, and permanently mount those speaker wires. But uh, yeah, the PLL circuit in this, actually, here is that IC right there. So you can see it's a TC5080P. And you can see what it's called. It's a programmable divider. It does not say phase lock loop. 
So it's not a PLL. And you can see there's really only two wires or, you know, connecting to this. Here's one here and one here, and that's it. Uh, you know, other than the channel selector display and everything, but yeah, I'm not counting that. But as far as interconnection into the rest of the radio, you can see there's only two connections. So, yeah, that's not really enough for a PLL circuit. And that's because it actually uses two separate phase comparators here. Okay, so you have, but between these two phase comparators and this programmable divider, it does make up a PLL. So it's basically a three-chip PLL circuit. It's not all in one chip. It's, like I say, it's early PLL technology, I guess you could say. Um, and, of course, Browning had to do their own thing. <laughs> um, so there is, and there's, you know, there's, IC there, and then you can see there's two inline SIP package ICs right here. But that's, like I say, that's what encompasses the PLL. It's not a one-chip wonder, like it radios just a, just a little bit after this in age, and everything afterwards where it's all done on one IC. This one is spread across a couple ICs. Some of the, the mixing frequencies, yeah, they're oddball also in this. Um, it does use a 10.240 crystal, but it, it actually uses that in a divide-by circuit. So it's actually, um, it's running at 5.120, that circuit. Uh, you know, kind of, a, there's just a few unique things in there. You know, the entire scheme of what they did with their synth, uh, frequency synthesis, um, but it works well. Uh, like I say, sensitivity is really good. So let me get the, uh, the covers put back on. I'll get it flipped over. I've already taken the the tape that I had on the bezel here, I've already taken that off because I was just getting ready to put the cover back on, put the screws in. I thought, well, I'll show the inside just in case anybody's never seen the inside of one. And this one's, like I say, virgin condition. Uh, only thing replaced in here was the electrolytic capacitors. So what you what you see is exactly how it would look like it when it left the factory, other than the caps are new. Um, yes, the missing parts here, you know, dif different versions, because this, this wasn't a Browning, you know, Browning didn't make this circuit board, obviously, it was made in Japan, um, so this board was used in other applications with other, you know, that had other options, but, uh, so, let me get her put back together, we'll get it flipped over and turn it on and do a little bit of listening on air. So this does have an adjustable ANL, or automatic noise limiter, which can be turned off. So. And it does quiet it up fairly nicely. Also has noise blanker, which of course noise blanker, you're, you're rarely ever going to really notice anything except for a, in a mobile application. Noise blankers are not for atmospheric type noise, they're for impulse noise, uh, specifically in mobile radios, which would be spark plugs or ignition systems in vehicles. But uh, there is a little bit of skip from down south rolling in. Yeah, nothing from the U.S. really. Five and nine are fairly busy. Yeah, Mexico is really starting to roll in. Of course, being up here is not going to do any good because this is not a sideband radio. does have a dimmer, and of course PACB switch, um, SWR, the uh, SWR control here is also controls the RF, so your output power, so that has an on off, so when you have it in the RF position, that's what the meter is when you key the microphone, and then once you turn this, that would be for adjusting for your SWR calibration, um, AM only radio, but it does have a delta tune. And if you listen, you 
you can hear there's actually a good bit of tuning range there. Um, and that actually was off a good bit. Actually, it was centered, was about right there when I first started with the radio. So the frequencies were, were considerably off in this thing. Um, you know, tone control. Tone is nice, uh, especially like for... Uh, for static for now that would be good for atmospheric type noises I always like radios that have a tune control because if you turn it you know, like this one about a quarter of the way I think that takes out a lot of that really high pitch your you know your static or white noise in the background so tune controlled adjustable not 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 switch selectable but actual adjustable ones actually I use them more as almost like an, uh, an automatic noise limiter but it's you know it's limiting the audio bandwidth on the top end. I can cut off some of those high frequencies, which is a lot of that static noise. It's really high pitched noise. Tone controls are really good for that. And you can hear you know if I go the whole way. So. You can see, like I said, the radio is in about as close to out-of-the-box new condition as you can get. I can see in person, you know, if I almost lay my eyeballs on the on the chrome bezel, I can just barely start to see the, the slightest hints that, uh, you know, a little bit of pitting might be starting to happen in the chrome. Um, but I get the feeling that's because the radio has been sitting for a long time in storage. Might have had a tiny bit of dampness. Uh, but like I said, it, you can't feel it. You really have to, you know, even from just a few inches away, you can't even see it. You literally almost have to you know, have your eyes like that far away from the chrome to see it. But luckily, you know, it's been caught. Um, this, the owner of this radio is a collector. So, you know, I know he's going to take really good care of it. I've, I've done, you know, a bunch of classic radios like this. And it's always nice to see uh, a nice radio like this go to somebody that can really appreciate a good, you know, quality built radio. Like I say, it's not an early Browning. Um, it's, you know, one of the later ones. But uh, still a, a, a high, you know, high top end, you know, AM only radio. Um, so there you go. There's the Browning by Sabre.